Hello, everyone. My name is Stefan Giesen. I'm the editorial director for business and economics at the Greuther. In addition to Dr. Bettina Asadek Lewinsky, who I'm introduced in a moment, I'm your host today. It's a book reading event, Women in Top Management. Before we start, let me say some words about the Greuther. The Greuther is based in Berlin. It is one of the oldest independent publishers in Germany, with a history dating back more than 270 years. We are one of the leading publishers of academic content and also publish book for business professionals. In total, we publish more than 1,300 new books each year next to journals and digital products. After this short but important note, now we come to the event. Um, our author, Dr. Bettina sadek lovitsky gives a voice to successful female rule models and top management functions on, in her book, Women in Top Management. Rule models from around the globe share the paths to success. Her guests, all in high management functions themselves, will read the authentic citations of top female managers from several countries. I'm especially happy that all agreed to be here with us today. In this reading event, you will experience a moment of learning and reflection in a very unique style of a book reading event. And you will learn from authentic experience of experienced female role models nice. from a different culture environment about how to better handle the challenges for women in management. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the moderator of the event. Dr. Bettina Asadek Lovinsky is a researcher, author, and certified international mentor coach. Following a long management career in multinational companies, she has worked as an international executive coach and expert on diversity in Germany, France, Japan, and China. In 2015, she founded the Global Women Career Lab, a worldwide research and training initiative for women, women in leadership positions. The book is a result of the intensive research in five nations with more than two, 110 sorry, top women managers. Before we begin, maybe I, if I may, Bettina, I have some quick questions for you. Uh, Bettina, what exactly did you research for the book and how did you find these fascinating role models? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Stefan, for the introduction. And first of all, thank you to all the team of the Greuther for uh, organizing a second time for us an international panel on how women globally rise into top management. And that uh, for the participants, that tells us also about the importance of the topic for the Greuther. Well, I'm overwhelmed to see my guests here on the screen. And so um, my order is totally collapsing here, what I have prepared, but I'm so grateful that they all joined. My research with the Global Women Career Lab for the book traces the successful career paths of fascinating women. And I had the pleasure to interview 110 of them all in very high senior positions across different countries. And so the journey went to Russia, to China, to France, to Japan, and of course, to my home country, to Germany. The book wants to shed light to the question of how female executives from all over the world plan their corporate career, mm -hmm. what techniques they use to overcome obstacles, and of course, we will hear about the leadership style that enabled the women to um, rise to senior management and then, and that's very important, remain there. Yeah, that's another topic that we have. I followed a model including various determinants and you know this topic is so wide. So we look at um, the environment, family influences, the role of mentoring, sponsoring, as well as personality factors and the leadership style of the women. So how did I find all of them, the 110? 
where we have a selected theoretical sample following a strict protocol. And um, it was a lot of support from men, but mainly women to get into contact. And through my work as executive coach and uh, a leadership trainer in the various countries, I met women and then they recommended me mm -hmm. and recommended me. And so it's a wave of solidarity that made this research possible. Impressive, great. And what motivated you to research and write this book? Well, the research and the book um, are my contribution to supporting more women into top levels in the corporate world. And um, I wanted to create something lasting, something meaningful, mm -hmm. research-based, but also in intercultural. So going beyond borders of one country. And I think that's even more important in the phase that we are in right now as the world. No? So to go beyond uh, borders. And another thing was the lack of research, mm -hmm. which has been done only with women. There are not so many big um, studies out there that only focus on women in management. Usually we are compared to men. So my approach is I wanted to um, analyze that. And in the first stage of the project uh, that has been a PhD with the University of Burgundy, I also focused on that and looked into that. So um, in the end, I want to make female role models visible and not compare them and making the fact that we have already great women up there um, more visible to the world. So last but not least, I have a daughter. She's turning 15 now and we had great discussions on this book. And my little son asked me, mama, can men become also feminist? And then I knew it's worth all the work that I did for this, this book here. So this is really my personal background. Okay, many thanks, Bettina. And what are the topics that you have chosen for hmm. the listeners today? Yeah, that, that was a little bit difficult because there are so many citations in the book and they are all beautiful. So the book has five chapters and we go deep into each nation. And then we have a chapter that unites all the findings of the women. So um, as the French would say, we will have appetizers now. In France, it's time for lunch. So let's go for l'aperitif. We will give you a glimpse of what you can read much more in depth in the book. And we have four topics. The first one is how is environment and different cultures influencing women careers the world over? The second one is the importance of career orientation. Then we will hear about career enhancing factors and career strategies. And of course, the last topic will be challenges. And my guests here, they are all strong supporters for the global research and they are role models. And I think this is why they are here today also because they are supporting other women. So let me welcome Britta Bombard sitting in the US. Hello, Britta. Muriel de Saint Sauveur in France, in Paris. Mikitano in Kobe, Japan, my old home. And we have Catherine Laduce in France, in the south right now of France. We have Marino Gami from Tokyo, originally from Kobe. We have Christine Rittner from Germany. And um, then we have Professor Manuela Rousseau from Hamburg, Germany. We have Chelly Chen, the last one who made it to, to come into the call in China, in um, Shanghai. And we have Dr. Marion Welp, also from Germany. So one thing to note before we start, the citations the lady will read are not from them. They, they borrow their voices to the 110 ladies today and nationalities are mixed up. And um, yeah, so let's start with the first topic. How do environment and different cultures influence women careers in the world? So I choose the countries from the top level of uh, women participation in management, Russia, China, the solid middle, which is France, and then the lower ranks, and that's Germany and Japan. So we will have very different environments. And you will hear ratings in the first citations. And the ratings are the answer to the question I asked to the ladies, 
how do you personally read, rate um, gender equality? And they answered that on a scale from zero to 10. Zero means no gender equality and tens mean perfect, I have it all. So when you hear a number now, this is the context. So let us start with France. And the chapter for friends is called Intellectual Barriers Against Role Conflict. And they are really intellectual and they are combatants, the French lady I met. France has so much achieved for women and also for women in the corporate world with their quotas and laws like the Cope Zimmermann law. In the country, full-time work is widely accepted. And on top of that, French women sometimes have a lot of children. So let us hear and let us start the reading with, uh, with um, uh, my first guest on what we hear from France. Catherine, please, you are Thank open. You. Thank you, Bettina. Hello, everybody. Yeah, so it's the first quote is from the VP of France. I am going to give France a six. I almost said five. And then I thought to myself, well, things are changed in France and moving in the direction of gender equality. But we haven't solved the problem of violence against women. A lot of women in France still die because of domestic violence. We haven't solved equal pay or the gender pay gap. We still have 70% women on executive committee. We have all the same stereotype as in every country. We haven't solved any of that, but all the same, we do live in a society where women have a place. They can go out in public. They don't have to hide away. They can go to work. It's not the same, not like that in every country. But I think as point that given that France is a country of human rights and women rights, we really could do better. Okay. Um, my citation comes from a general manager in France. From a professional point of view, I'm aware that women on average get paid 25% less for the same job. And I've experienced this myself in my various jobs. I keep hearing comments from people like, well, she's a woman, she's gonna have kids. So they are disadvantaged compared to men applying for the same job. I was really shocked and I have found against that. The situation isn't equitable because for women, it always ends up being about family commitments and they never ask men those questions. So I find that really unfair. France isn't that bad because there are so many policies aimed at changing things. There have also been quotas introduced, particularly in public companies, to force companies to have women on boards of director. And it's better for the corporate image from the point of view of the shareholders if there are a few women in senior positions. It's part of a sustainable development agenda to demonstrate diversity. They are compelled to do so in a way. Okay, so I'm citing an HR director in France. So the six I gave France, I think the situation has changed. There has been progress. We've come a long way if you think back to the period of the 60s to the 80s. We had this view of a society in which women really didn't work. I think things are changing as the younger generations come along. Basically, I see all the, I mean, in my own socio-professional category, most of the young fathers, the 40-somethings who are dads and the 40-somethings who are women, the moms, the women all work. Yes, these days they work. I see it with all my friends. I also know this is not necessarily the case in other classes. Well, I'm talking about my own socio-professional category. I know that in other environments, it's not necessarily the case. I'm talking now about the middle classes and above. In the more disadvantaged social classes, I think there's still a lot of women who can't work and have children. They can't afford to pay a nanny to be there 
until eight in the evening. That was, thank you ladies, a good start and the appetizer from France. So let us move to the other side of the world, to Russia. And I was very happy getting the chance to interview there because according to some figures that we have, Russia might be the world leader when it comes to women participation in top management. And in the book, you can dive into the history and also the socio-economical perspective at the beginning. Women in Russia described a U-curve. So having it heights in the past, then it went really low during the opening, and now they are on an upwards trend again. So let's listen to some voices from Russia, please. I'm reading from a CEO from the media market in Russia. I used to hate the Soviets as a young woman. You know, when you are young, you often see black or white. Today, I see that it was the Soviets who gave women equal rights, the right to vote and equal educational opportunities. Men and women should be the same. There was a report about young people who came to us from Spain in World War II and were trained at the best universities. The woman should return to the stove when they return home. Can you imagine that? In Spain in the 1950s, women had to be housewives. Nothing else was possible. It was very different with us. I learned that everything is black or white. Also, I welcome the opening of our country. It was the Soviets who laid the foundation for equality with us. I, I have the opportunity to read from the director in Russia. What I heard from my mother, there was no difference in the Soviet Union. Today, the discrimination is higher. My citations is from a general manager in Russia. Women are afraid of power. If they want it, it's absolutely possible. That is why I gave only five. In our company, we are five women. All bosses are women every year. 10 to 15 percent more women. Mm. Yeah, so some little appetizers from Russia. And let us move to Germany, my home country. Germany is at the lower ranks of women participation in top management. And the fact, and that might be surprising to some of the listeners, that we had a female chancellor for so many years has not changed that. The country is oriented part-time work for women, and I would say is mother-centric still. So, but there's a lot moving in the last year. So we have quotas for supervisory boards and quotas now also for the DEX companies. So let's hear from Germany. General manager Germany. And I think there's still a big difference in Germany. And I even say that I have the feeling that it's getting more socially acceptable to make flippant remarks if a woman has technical expertise or works in IT. For example, it is socially acceptable to make fun of them. A Chinese director in Germany. Well, Angela Merkel, she was once the pride of Germany that you had a female chancellor but she was given a role, the mother. She was called mother. They had to change her role a bit so that a woman legitimized to be at the top. That was my feeling. And when I talk to people in society, in a doctor's office or in a supermarket, when people hear I only take six months of parental leave, then they always say, oh, so short. What do you do with your child? poor child, so long in daycare, that is always subliminally accu accusing how you can, as a mother, being so career-oriented, treat your child so badly. Reading from a member of the advisory board Germany. In Germany, you don't have to look far. Women, no matter what they do, are never seen in a positive light. So I'd like to back that up. The way I always describe it is, women who don't have children are randy women's livers. Women who decide to work part-time, well, 
they probably have to because their husbands don't earn enough or because they want to find themselves. Women who work full time and have children, well, obviously they are the typical bad mother types and are only interested in themselves. I had a mentee who demonstrated this really clearly to me. She said, my husband is proud of me actually because I've got my PhD now and because I want to go and work abroad. And she really wants to go abroad. But her mother-in-law was always telling her son, you don't need her to go out to work. She does too much, you should. So it doesn't matter whether it's in the family or in the surrounding environment. There are very few positive messages that signal to women, if you want to have a career, if you want to take the plunge, if you want to work, that's fantastic. It's the right thing to do and it's great. The traditional ways of thinking are so entrenched that they act like roadblocks and barriers and that discourages women instead of people coming up to you and saying, wow, you have got fighting spirit. You can do it. You can totally do it. In my opinion, there's far too little of that in Germany. There's too much criticism, too much prejudices, old ways of thinking that don't make it easy for women to decide wholeheartedly to pursue a career. This is from a Chinese director who was working in Germany. I think there is a strange management atmosphere in which a career woman is not normal or a negative stigma for men. I found this gender bias discrimination maybe three times, maybe five times as big as in China. And this out atmosphere of society and in a company goes deep into the minds of women, into her inner self. They limit their objectives, their thinking, they make themselves smaller. So that's the most negative part. The second is the supporting resource. In China, children go to school all day, whether in kindergarten, elementary or middle school. It's from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. It's normal. Here, you know that school is only half a day or when you go to school, most are open until 3 p.m. I don't know how many are open until 5 or 6 p.m. And then here to find a nanny 24 hours a day. I don't find one in my network of friends. It's normal in Shanghai, Beijing. A Chinese GM advisory board member about her time in Germany. In Germany, there are fundamental social problems there is a German word, Ravenmutter, Raven mother or bad mother. And there are also enough parents in law who say that if you have children, you shouldn't go to work. That's why a working mother in Germany has a much poorer reputation. The social environment for career women in Germany is more difficult because the fact that a working mother is something normal does not exist in Germany. And the second point is that women want to pursue less careers and the will of women is also not strong enough. That is my explanation. I have enough young women with me. I would like to support them. They said, Mrs. C, please do not put me under pressure. I just want a normal life with children and part-time work. Hmm. Yeah, something to think about. I, sh I, I have chosen the heavy ones here and I hope you don't mind listeners from Germany. So let's move to China and China takes two chapters in the book, um, women in mainland China and women in Europe um, because I found they are kind of pioneers for their country. And surprisingly for many outsiders, China has a high number of women in senior levels, at least in the multinational environment. But I now started also interviewing in state-owned companies and also the women there rate their chances pretty high. Let's hear from them. I'm citing a CFO in China. There's no single answer. In big cities, it is quite equal. In rural areas, less equality. In multinational companies, no preference of male or female. Reading from a vice president in China. In some case, the female has more equality, 
In big cities, it is quite equal. I think it is equal. Also the pay. In China, women do not stay at home like in other countries. Catherine, we can't hear you. You have to unmute. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, a quote from a president in China. Today women are more powerful than men in China. Also girls, today are already much better from school on work. I have a citation from a VP in China. I think it coexists. Deep down, the fundamental society links to the Confucius, the Chinese traditions, that still very still male dominated. But I think the ironic thing is the communist influence on the culture is that the communism has brought perfect gender equality. It encouraged women in the revolution to be as active as men. I think that the influence comes from the communist. Mm. And the advertisers will go to dinner or a big meal in the book uh, if you are interested in Chinese women. Let's go to Japan. Last but not least, but very big in my heart, my own old home. In Japan, the, the rate of um, women in senior management is still very, very low. And we see women disappearing once they have children. And there are many, many reasons to this that you can read in the book. And we will hear a little bit about it right now. Yep. Citation from a president in Japan. I would say three barriers, one which is famous. Japan has been known for long working hours and the lifetime employment. That system itself is supporting male to become more successful in career because every employee, if they want to go up in a company that are forced to work long hours, which is a difficult choice for many females. Lifetime employment requires you to work consistently, which is also another barrier for females who could have a chance to take, let's say, maternity leaves. The second one is because of that, females really don't have role models who supported them to become successful. That works as a vicious cycle. Because of known role model, many females never think of becoming managers. That's the second one. First one is society related. Second one is more mentally related. Third one I would say is a glass ceiling. Many of the systems of selecting managers or choosing the assignments are basically done by male managers who are used to a male company environment. I see a lot of cases where there is unspoken or unknown bias within their mind of not selecting females even when there is a good candidate. A citation from a senior director of Japan. I still think that there is not equality, equal opportunity for females to really thrive in the organizations. And looking at the challenges that women are having, I think it is still challenging to be a woman and working here in Japan compared to China, where there is much more opportunity to really flourish with equality. In Japan, I think it is still challenging. Speaking for HR Director Japan, that depends on the industry than the company. If you look at my company, I believe we have 25% senior level women. It's low and I actually self-selected to work for a foreign company fresh out of college. I'm trying to explain. I deliberately did not select a Japanese company because I know I wanted to build a career. And also my mother was telling me that if you want to work, and if you want to build a career, don't go and work for Japanese companies. You got to go to a foreign company. Recitation from vice president in Japan. I know that when I speak with my colleagues in the US, they experience the exact same thing. So I'm not sure if that's a Japanese thing. I think we see men spending probably two or three more hours because they don't have to do the household thing. Then when you go home, you compare yourself with other mothers, either without work or with part-time jobs. And you are spending more time on all of that. Whether business or private, you always feel that you are not doing enough 
So that's a constant feeling. I don't think that's very special to Japan. Hmm. Thank you, ladies. So this is the end of our first part. And let's go into the second topic. And the second topic is about career orientation and why a clear career orientation is so important for women who want to rise to high level function. So one major finding of the research was that no matter how challenging the environment is, women can rise and are successful when they have this point right, when they know what their career orientation is. The woman in the book have a strong will to rise in the company world, each one for their own reason, and nothing holds them away. No spouse, no children, and no discrimination. Let's hear about that. Again, HR Director Japan. Well, I thought I could lead this team or the organization better. Why does he do it that way? I don't think it's good. We should do it differently. I looked at my boss and thought I could do it better. I could run the department better. Money is secondary to me. President Japan, I think the most important decision I made in my life was when I had my first child. I decided to pursue my professional career without compromise. I asked support from everybody around me, included my husband, my mother, my boss, my co-workers. That was the biggest decision I made, next to joining a Japanese company or changing the job. That's not a difficult or important when I look back as a determination that you have to be professional and you want to climb the corporate ladder. The motivation and choice needs to come from women themselves. I would like to be the heart of the organization. That's what I chose this job as president. This became very clear to me, perhaps when I worked for more than 20 years after changing to another company. And then I realized that I wanted to be the heart sometime. HR Director Shaina. Planned in my case means that I was thinking about where I wanted to be today. I was quite aggressive compared with others my age. Not a very clear timeline, but at that time I told myself when I will be 35, 36 or 40, I want to be the head. I wanted to be really number one owner of, of that sort of area. Maybe Udi number one in China or HR head but I didn't have a very clear concept about power. I didn't care basically, but I wanted to really become competitive with a sort of competency in the same industry compared with my peers or compared with my friends. That was clear. But in no time I planned to join some big company. I was very clear for me that I did not want to join big company. Even today or the past few years, when any huge company approaches me, I always say no. Citation from a vice president in China. Ambition. I should say I'm a very ambitious person. I want to be somebody because in my company, I worked with many smart people. I want to be my boss. That's always what I think. I want to be my boss at the end of the day. A general manager from France. Equality is a big issue. We are quite good, but we are still far from reaching our goal. We still have a lot of encrusted traditions as a men's club. And women often see themselves in competition with each other. I think it's a lot about the individual woman and how much she really wants to make a career. Do not get me wrong. Every woman can make her choice, but you cannot have it all. Men neither. It depends on what you want and how much you want it. From a board member in Germany, men tend to think more about what they want. Women often don't dare. You have to hunt them to hunt. Citation from a president in Japan. We are exceptions, do you understand? 
Most women in Japan don't even think that they could become managers. I even mean the lower and middle levels. It is not yet available as a possibility in their worldview. The framework conditions for equality, of course, we have them in Japan. It depends on how a working world is organized. That makes it much more difficult for women. But I, nev I have never seen any limits for myself. Most important is actually the, what it is called ambition. You have to be ambitious. Then you have to have some professional anchor, regardless of male or female. You really believe in your professional skill set or experience, which makes it you believe that you can be definitely successful. Maybe when I work for more than 20 years after going to the other company, I realized that I want to be the head sometime. I would like to be the head of the organization. That's why I chose this job as a president. Thank you ladies for the second round. And we are coming to the third topic. What are the career preconditions and career strategies of the women in the book? And here we come to the core of the book. How did this women do it? What? rise to top management levels and gain influence and power to shape the work life for their employees. You will hear a variety of angles on the career preconditions and strategies. Please. Vice President China. Actually, it's kind of funny to say. So when I want to get ahead, I'm thinking, I look at my skill set as a pie chart. I will see which areas I still lack. And I'm thinking how I can build my resume internally or externally. This is how I choose the position. President Japan, honestly speaking, working for three different companies, especially if you're a young female, I think working at the environment where you can be successful is better. If I go back to the 20s, I would rather work for this company than another company because you really need a system and a boss's support, especially at, uh, at your junior level. So choose the right company. Diversity Director Japan. More generally, I think that when I look at female leaders, female sales managers, female district sales managers in my organization, Female leaders are generally good at developing people. Of course, there are many, many male managers who are very good at developing their people, but they tend to choose one or two people from the 10 they have on their team and only develop those. Imagine like their red right hand. I think women develop them all. The low performers, middle performers too but men only develop a few people and they pre-choose everything for the others. The general manager in France. There were probably two important steps that were significant in my career. The first was when I was first appointed marketing director. At that time, I was on the board of a very large company with 7,000 employees, 7 billion in revenue, and I was a group strategic marketing manager. And the other step was before that, when I was appointed sales director. I wanted much more autonomy and independence. I wanted to take more risk and to be more important. I mean, in the previous company. Really it was an excellent company right from the start because it was well-structured with a good procedure, expertise and management practice. But after a while, I wanted to take more risk and make progress. In fact, I think getting awards easier outside of companies and inside them for me. Part of the problem was that I was a female, I was a woman. I'm talking from a vice president in France. Let's get started. Perhaps the first step in explaining my career is that very early on, when I was in school, I knew I wanted to have a job that allowed me to go worldwide, globally, to be able to move. That's why I stopped working as a lawyer, because I felt that law was not flexible enough to allow me to move throughout my life. When I came out of school, I tried to find a job in the US, 
I lived in the US for nearly eight years when I was a child. So I intend to go back in the end. Having not found one in the US that I was happy with, I applied to jobs in Asia. And my first job was in Japan, where I was in marketing for a luxury brand. I think that was almost the first step in me than moving to multiple countries and working in regional roles going forward. German teacher or board member. I started at the company abroad and I always knew I wanted to go abroad. And so I just applied for a job. And so then uh, there I was just there. Even if it was a long time ago, it was a very important step for me. I did a lot of operative stuff there in, in the beginning. The company was still really small then. And so I got promoted very quickly, which nowadays wouldn't happen anymore. At 29, I was already the executive director and responsible for 1,000 employees. And because I was giving both management and specialist responsibility so quickly, I think that was what impressed people. Then I moved. I went to another country. I was managing director again. I was quickly given responsibility for sales and for the whole of the country. And for me, that was another important position because I think I came to see loads of things that I've learned um, in, uh, in, in, in the country before in a completely different way. And I think I stepped on a few toes there. I think that I made myself a bit more noticeable because I did that. And then I was offered the job as CEO in a third country. And I think I got it because uh, my superior saw how quickly I adjusted to new situations and I have the courage to address issues and to implement things. And I think I've always done a real good job taking employees with me. So somehow I always managed to get the whole team behind me. That's how we were able to push things forward together as a team. And in the third country, it was a completely new situation for me all over again. I started there with 30 employees. I'd never had so few employees in the whole course of my career. And I had to build up a completely new purchasing team, a real estate team. We would build up everything from scratch, just like with a startup. I had to completely immerse myself in a new culture. And then suddenly head office said, you seem to have a good report with your employees. You get ideas across well. How would uh, you like to restructure our HR department? And so then I became chief human resource officer. It sounds easy, but it was a very long road. I'm citing from a CMO in Germany. <clears throat> well, I think one factor was understanding that the circumstances have to be right. Telling myself much more deliberately to look for a new job right now, looking for companies where it's feasible. And as I said, that was my big insight after my time at my old company. There, women never amounted to anything. Saying to yourself when you're in that situation, that you need to be more selective in your choice of company. Well, my boss at the next company, he was gender blind, or maybe he just didn't care. He only cared about us delivering results. I'd say this was definitely a major breakthrough. It's not just about being a woman. We do have a particular way of doing things and every company has a particular culture. And then I realized that people usually promote people who are similar to themselves. So of course that means I always never get promoted because of course I'm not like anyone else no matter where I go. And then you say to yourself, okay, choose companies where performance matters most. For example, I can't join a company that is in my view, highly political. My next company, for example, is very influenced by French culture. Although that's improved somewhat in recent years. But if you're not French there, then you get nowhere. And you have to sort through the companies more carefully as well and say, you would fit in there, you wouldn't fit in there. When it comes to switching companies, make your selection criteria much more explicit. A quote from the president in China. Innovation is not really an important thing, but at least visionary is important. People need to have a bigger picture and visioning what your next five or 10 years are supposed to be. 
not only on your career path, but other things you do your daily job. In the company, not stick to the small area. A HR director in China, I was not looking for balance. I was looking for some stretch and challenge. I wanted to really step from a supporting role, nice role, to a very business impact role. Impact again. This was my first role. It's a business HR partner role when I joined in 2012. My key work was really about redesign the company and support the company to do the change management, also the layoff, all the tough things. Then I was promoted to be the China HR head in 2013. At that time, I started to own everything, including operation strategic at partner level till today. My citation comes from a CEO in Russia. I can't clearly explain what I want to, because now during my life, I've worked with different people who were like my bosses. I know that I saw it's not easy to find a person who tell you clearly what he wants from you. Usually, I can spear clear the goal, and I can explain to the other people what is the goal. Even sometimes, I hope that then I can explain how to get there because I'm very concentrated on the goals. If I know what kind of goal, I can see it, and I can see clearly what to do, and I can clearly explain. For example, I had a great, great boss, other man, mostly men. The only problem with them was he said, you're much more talented than me, much more gifted. But they didn't understand sometimes what they want. They were talented at times. Then sometimes it's better for them to write a novel and not lead people, for example. For me, I'm not like a very popular person. No, I couldn't say that I love to be in public. No, it's not about me. I'm not such kind of person. But anyway, for me, it was much easier to cooperate with people and to explain what to do because it happened. Because the mass, they have great ideas. They have desires, but they don't want to do all the steps. I'm very open-minded, I'm very well educated. I do my research on everything, what's new, and that is why I changed all my rest to digital when it just started. I want to see something. You are not stuck in the last place. I hate when the people are talking about, do you remember how great it was in the past, blah, blah, blah. The citation is from CEO Russia. I think in the course of my work, I have the ideas. I have a vision and a very clear understanding of where we are going. It is not negotiable. I would always ask people to come up with ideas they have and asking questions. I think in terms of the vision and that goes back to the transparency and visibility of what is happening. So we do it together. We actually prepare a lot of things together. We throw a few ideas around and discuss them. Then I decide. It's not negotiable anymore. Citation from CFO in China. I think everything is planned or not planned, to be honest. I think the result is not planned, but the things I want to achieve very much are planned. For example, when I wanted to get into this company, actually, at the beginning, I knew nothing about the company. I knew nothing about it because there was limited information at that time. When, I, when, we, started to learn, no, when we started to learn know about the career's progress and how we needed to perform in the company, basically, I started to plan or to know what I want to do in the company. I wanted to do financial analysis. I wanted to do a better job. I wanted to learn more and get promoted. Eventually, I never set a target that I want to get promoted in two years or three years. 
That was not planned. Every promotion is not planned. But I will plan that I want to do this job. I want to grow into this level. Eventually, it will come. It will be good. Advisory Board Germany. There is a saying, if the task doesn't frighten me, then the task is too small. It was some African president, I think, who said that, the first woman president of Nigeria or somewhere. It really spoke to me. I can see myself saying, she's a funny one. That was on my first day at the company. I was quite scared, but I can't deal with that. I know my fear is trying to protect me and it is sending me signals. But I also know that I can allow it to stop me. I can't let it stop me from taking the next step. I think a lot of people stop at this point, Uda, at this point, where they're feeling fear or in theory. But I never do. I never found that. Mm. So I hope you could have picked the one or the other idea for your own planning, for your own career from these citations. And of course, you can all reread them. There's a lot of advice um, in these uh, quotations. So let us move to the last area that we want to give you appetizers now. And these are, of course, the challenges on the way. And this is what we hear when we do mentor coaching groups and when we work with women, there are a lot of, lot of challenges and we need to find ways to overcome them. So nobody says it is all easy. And it's also not easy for men, if you ask them. Is there a recipe that we women can all use? Probably it's a mix of responding to the various career determinants and, and areas and handling challenges in a positive way. And what I learned from the women is a very positive mindset and ongoing learning. So we have women who are older than 60 years in the research pool and they still continue yeah? and they've done things at their 50s, 55, 60s, and then 65. And even in China, we had the oldest lady of the research. She's still active and powerful and doing a lot of things. So ongoing learning, I think is really an advice from the, the group here and never give up. So let's hear about the challenges on the way. A citation from a Chinese member of the executive board working in Germany. These four years, I separated location-wise from my husband and my husband was in Hong Kong, flew around the world. My son was in New York. My parents are in Shanghai. When we left, my daughter was so young, only seven years old. I did it because I believe in diversity. Bettina, you have to mention that. I'm a strong promoter of diversity. I hired my sister and her husband to help me in Germany. When the child and with driving, that was a huge financial burden. I was firmly convinced that I was a role model and gave up my pleasant life in Shanghai. There you have a driver, you have a nanny 24 hours a day, and then go to Germany without all that. Chair Chairperson of Supervisory Board Germany, child and career, still a tightrope walk. I once had an employee with me who cried when she told me that she was pregnant. I will never forget that. It's a real barrier in many companies. In my generation, it was a total exception for women with children to reach the top. I don't think it really works career and children. Citation from a general manager, Franz. You know what, if you have kids, and you are a middle manager and you, you go to work each day thinking so much of what I do is routine stuff, but they want to give me a new job. The reason it happens is because you know your job so well. 
you've reached a certain level, but you don't want to admit that you don't really want to rise any higher. Of course, women are under more pressure, so you have to be able to handle that pressure. It depends on how guilty you feel. In general, women feel more guilt. I always felt guilty, but I was very selfish. So I wanted to move up. I thought, okay, so I have to compromise where my kids are con concerned. But a lot of women don't want to do that. That's no solution though, it's either or. If you have a big ego and if you are selfish, you leave your children to be looked after by other people. So you can, so as you can get out of the house. Women cannot just say, oh, I'm not getting anywhere because they don't give women that, uh, that good breaks. Because actually they really want to stay in middle management and spend more time with their kids. HR Vice President China. She's 58. She's a very diligent woman. She takes care of me, my husband, and my kid. She can organize everything. Sometimes I feel that I need to do something, so I will buy something, which maybe they don't have time. They never ask me for anything. Citation from a general manager in France. I had my first two children when I was at a Swiss company and my third child when I was at a US company. When I was with the Swiss company, which is a good company, I heard some people think things like, She's got a photo of her kids on her desk. She'll have less time for her work now. I was really shocked, especially because they were seeing it behind my back. When I had my third child, I had been at a US company for about 18 months. And then I became pregnant. My boss, who was a woman, told me she wasn't happy about it. I was pretty shocked because she had two children too. Okay, now it's a quote from me, Communication Director of France. You know, in 91, the Human Resource Director at one particular company, which is a French bank, said to me, your husband is a senior executive and you have three small girls, so why do you want to work? That was the day I became a feminist, because that kind of thinking is completely unacceptable. Yes, that was in 91 but it could still happen today. I decided against staying with that company and it gave me the impetus to move on on something else. That was a boomerang effect. And now I think that if they had appointed me, I would not have had the career I have because I would not have joined US company, Chinese company. So there is a lesson there. You need obstacles. That was the Chinese say, challenge means opportunity. It's, it, this is an opportunity principle. Something positive always comes for out of something negative. I am really convinced of that. I'm citing a general manager in France. I think women are not supported, not unified. Me, recently I've come to that conclusion that the main reason why women will not make it is because there's still that biological instinct to fight against the other women, which men don't have. Men, they might fight if they're in a competition for something, and that's normal. But then if they're not, they are going to co-opt each other. They're going to help each other. Women, we say we do. And then if you're in different companies, different industries, for sure we do. When it comes to the same industry, same group, I think women are worst enemies. I'm really sad to say that. I've experienced it a year ago when my former CEO offered me another position. And he wanted me to replace somebody who was in the job who decided to leave. She was a woman. She had been in the job for 18 years. She decided alone to leave the group. Honestly, nobody pushed her out. Now she left because she was so frustrated because they had never offered her anything else. So she left being very bitter. She offered me that position. Everybody was aligned, the artistry director of that business. Everybody was aligned. She found out that I was offered the position she went to see our shareholder and she told him, even though she was leaving the group, that I shouldn't get the job. I got along with her. I think she couldn't face the fact that I was getting something when she hadn't. For me that day, I realized, honestly, 
Because if we had been in competition for the job, sure, that's part of life. And men would do the same thing. But in that situation, you're like, wow, it's so ingrained, I think, for women that if they don't succeed, then another woman, woman cannot. I think because it's so difficult, there's a jealousy when women manage to do it. Why more between women? Again, because I tried to explain, the, especially if we hadn't liked each other, I would have understood, but it wasn't the case because I respected her, I liked her, we got along. For me, it came as a big shock. The job was frustrating, but the worst was really to understand how women sometimes can still be. Again, I fundamentally believe if we don't all change that, we will never make it, never. Again, it comes from really ancient times. We were staying at home, raising the children. The men were going to hunt and fight, being together between friends, and we had to protect our nest against other women who would have stolen our money. I really do believe it's biological. Citation from director from Germany. Not long before I went on maternity leave, we got this new CFO, a very successful woman. And I wasn't aware of this at the time, but I'm pretty sure now that I received a promotion at that time because this woman was on the board and pushed for me to get it. What I'm trying to say is that it makes an incredible difference whether there are women on the senior management team or not. Now that I'm in a position to have such a role myself to an extent I in turn promote and bring other women. So she was the first woman who was above me really and who could exit considerable inference in favor of women. I do not know if I'd ever have become a boss if, I, if she hadn't joined the company. Even if my boss thought I was good and so on whether he would have actually taken the step of promoting me, I don't know. HR director, Germany. Then a new CEO arrived and he met the first and second management tiers. And then there was a reshuffle. I got along with him really well, shared the same values. And what I'm about to say, I really mean. For once in my life, I dare to speak up my mind. And as a result, I was with the company for all my seven years. And after that, I was really ready. I knew everything inside out and back to front. I built up my career there. I couldn't get any higher there, but I was ready for a new challenge. Then he said, wait a while, not yet, it's too soon. I've made a mental note of it. I'll be getting to you soon. And so I waited. I didn't go up to him every week and ask him again and again and try to negotiate for a better job. And then after about nine months, he told me that the head of HR had left and he wanted me to have a more structured, ordered, systematic approach to that department. As a lawyer, I'd been able to do that. He'd been observing me and how I worked. I was good with people. Citation from a GM in France. I would have progressed faster because mainly because there were international opportunities I could have taken because I didn't want to work abroad at, the, at, at some point, but it was a bit difficult to achieve that with two careers. At one point, my husband had a good job opportunity, but I couldn't relocate. And then I had an opportunity when I had my job in London, but then he couldn't move. These days, he earns more, more, than I, more than me, a lot more. I think salary counts for a lot. It's an undeniable fact. Then there's uh, the impact of traditional gender roles. I know couples where the man earns less than the women, but the man still seems to have at least as much say in what he does with his career as a woman does. That's just not logical. Housework? My husband cooks sometimes, and sometimes he takes the garbage out, but he only does stuff when I complain. Otherwise, he just assumes that everything is fine. I do a lot more around the house than he does. 
citation from the general manager of France. Yes, it's crazy. And I see all those men here. A big difference also is I think all the men in senior position, most of them don't have a wife who works. When you think about it, all they have to do is think about themselves. Plus, they have somebody at home who thinks about themselves as well. Yes, it's crazy. And I see all those men here. A big difference also is I think all the women in senior position, all the men in senior position, most of them don't have a wife who works. When you think about it, they think about themselves. Around me, none of their wives are working, none. They all at home dealing with the children, going with them to official parties when they have to, organizing vacations, organizing their life and making sure that dinner is served. Literally, that's what happens. Vice President Germany, power. It varies a lot between men and women. I'd say men tend to be afraid of losing power. To them, it's everything. It's linked to competition. I got this job at the top, I'm the CEO now. So there's nowhere else to go. And for men, losing that position of power is purely about competition. It's all about fear. Women aren't like that. Women are more afraid of gaining power because power is still characterized by domination, force, abuse of power. I admit that I want power and I know that if I have power, I can shape. I can have an impact on things. And for me, the power to shape is the opposite of powerlessness. I don't want to be controlled. I want to be in control and have influence. And that's something I've proven I can do. But a lot of women are afraid of power. They don't want to exercise power in a masculine way and manipulate or use uh, or belittle others. I think men and women have a different understanding of what power is and what gives me power. Men need to prestige, uh, men need uh, prestige more than women do. I think that they need these. I was about to say signatures. That's not what I mean. What's the word? Uh, they need to have a crown. What do you say for that? Men need power, the big car, the big offers, and so on. But women don't even ask whether they're going to get a big car or big offers. Women just say, what will my task be? What can I achieve? Who will be on my team? Women are after purpose rather than prestige. Women and men just do define and understand power differently. Senior Director, Germany. Well, mentoring definitely helps. You do have to be careful and especially in companies who try to force mentoring on you. I've experienced one case where I was assigned a mentor, which was a complete flop because the chemistry didn't work at all. So from my point to view, the most useful thing is when mentoring developments natural out of a relationship and you have a lot of contact with that person and you get on well and a mentoring relationship just develops out of it. In my opinion, the best way is when it's never directly referred to us uh, to as mentoring. But when you just do it, the relationship I have with uh, our CFO, for example, I don't know if I would call her a mentor or a sponsor in any case. I have the sort of relationship with her where I know I can turn to her of all sorts of issues whenever I need a sparing partner. And I know there is someone there who is willing to listen to me and who can count on me and who will stand up for me when the going gets tough. Yeah, thank you so much. And we all need such a person. And I have found today nine of them. I'm, I'm very, very grateful for your reading. And I hope the participant enjoyed it. And we are a little bit over time, but I still will do my final words. And perhaps then we can have questions with the one who wants to stay. So the book, as I said in the beginning, has this chapter that summarizes it what all the top managers from the various nations have in common. Let me finish by 
talking briefly of some of the important key learnings and you have heard them in the citations already. And then you can go from our aperitif to lunch or dinner, wherever you are in the world. So first key learning, um, clarify your own career orientation. It's very individual for each woman, for each family also, but when you are clear with it, everything that follows will be easier. The role models in the research were very, very focused and strategic with their career decisions. The women also were looking for chances and if the chances were not there, they were creating the chances. One woman built a new company within the given company. So um, um, trying to find chances and a lot of them were happily moving outside their comfort zone. So I learned that risk taking is very, very important. These women freed themselves from the judgments of others. And that's very important, depending on your environment and how they see you as a powerful woman. Other life roles, such as being a spouse or mother, have to fit with their primary role of the top women manager. That's not for everybody, yeah? But if we talk about rising in the company, yeah, probably it can give us some perspectives how we can do it differently. What we can learn from all of them is strong solidarity with other women. And we've heard two examples here, not the good side and uh, rivalry among women. So I think a big learning is promote other women and support other women and it will come back to you in a cycle. And the last thing is the lifelong learning. So the women use mentoring and coaching frequently. And I don't say that because I'm a coach, I know it's working. So develop further as leaders. So I want to thank my readers here, the nine ladies, wonderful. You are all role models um, and representing the findings of the book. And mainly you are all, um, so much, uh, giving so much solidarity to projects like these and I know many others in your countries. And this made the long work worse for me and I'm very happy to have uh, this meeting here in May. And I'm thanking again, Stefan to host us. And Stefan, I lead over to you now. Do we answer some questions? Could you pick a question? So we are, we are over time, I know, but- uh, <laughs> Yes, we are completely. Uh, beyond the schedule of time, uh, Bettina. But nevertheless, uh, thank you for staying, uh, who's there. Um, I will ask maybe some kind of few questions mm -hmm. that were written in the chat room. And um, I would say we are probably cannot answer them all or in great detail. Maybe that was an inter interesting question to you. Uh, where are we at the beginning, Bettina? Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you are interested in exploring female role models, but you're interested in comparing them. Could you clarify why? Well, the, the, the research itself has not been framed as a comparative research. It's a qualitative research and I used content analysis. So I structured the outcome following my model. It's not really comparing women to other women. So, and it's not comparing these women to men. So the approach was more really to, um, to extract the beauty of the learning in the book. Okay. I think Britta and someone else uh, already answered on this question, but there was also a question that, um, that someone observed uh, the Chinese and the French framework and most of the inequalities came from the invisible social perceptions of people, prejudges for women, and consequently women are deprived in many opportunities in certain sectors. And um, there was a question then, could you share more about how you did or do cope with this kind of situation, if ever that's your case? What's do you understand the question? Also the question is, uh, how do you go or Say if you have some kind of pre-justice for, for women and how do you motivate and how you react on this? If I may, I think it is referring to the stereotype, you know, mm -hmm. and also, of course, which are some obstacles. And uh, 
And uh, what I would like just to say as a working, uh, working 15 years for Chinese companies, so for Lenovo, uh, I have seen that, uh, of course, there is stereotype and uh, sexism is everywhere, but I have seen that in some culture, and I would say, like to say that in China, in, in particular in my company, uh, there is really an effort to make sure that uh, we, we fight against the stereotype and we give, you know, the, I would say, more freedom and, uh, and we don't uh, judge people in, the, in terms of their gender, but we judge really people in terms of, uh, of competence and talent. And uh, so I, even, I think it was much better than sometimes in some very traditional French company. And I am French, so I can criticize, you know, <laughs> my, my, my own country because I know that tradition are sometimes very, very strong. But probably I was in a tech company and uh, tech company are also a little bit more advanced than the traditional, you know, industry everywhere. Okay, um, maybe we can ask um, two more questions. Um, there was also a question, do you think it's possible to build a manager core business world that plays only on women roles system? How to implement such a system? And it's possible at all. Hmm. Who will answer this question? To implement a management system only with women. That was the question. Yes, I believe uh, I interpret this question in this way. Yeah. Well, actually, from a research point of view, mixed leadership teams are the ones supposed to be the best who harmonize masculine and feminine uh, strengths. Yeah, and and these can be in women and in men. No? It's not black and white. So, from research, we know that these companies who have really mixed le leadership teams have better results than other companies. And you, you can find when you Google that mixed leadership and so on, you can find a lot of examples for that. Mm -hmm. That is maybe also helpful for Beverly who asked about the editorial board members. And maybe my, my last question from the chat room is um, the last one that I saw in the chat room. How can academic balance work in family? That's a really difficult question. Hmm. Hmm. From the ones who have children here, Mari, do you have an idea on that? How, how to combine career with, with children? What would be your advice, Mari? I think it's actually good to have both. <laughs> <laughs> I always, and I, I see a lot of notes, right? Um, when kids are small, it's really tough. But if you are willing to get other support, it really pays off. Mm -hmm. And uh, the like coaching, for example, you learn so much from child, your own child. So having both is uh, really a treasure. So don't think of it's a challenge. Think of it as a pleasure <laughs> or opportunity. I, I think somebody mentioned that in a Chinese, Words. There is a very famous saying, which Japanese also love, um, crisis is an opportunity, so mm -hmm. it's an opportunity. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, uh, then Okay. Then my final words, maybe. As many thanks uh, for this inspiring webinar or reading event the, and the audience for this interesting question. Sorry that we cannot answer all the questions. The, the ladies for the great insights and Bettina for the excellent moderation. Um, I wrote that in the chat, um, our reading event was recorded the whole time. You will, find, uh, you will find a video on our YouTube channel, or we will share it on our social media channels, and you get it also with uh, our mailings if you register for this uh, reading event. I wish you all a good evening, afternoon, morning, depending where you are at the moment. Goodbye and take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.